take a lot of pride in the fact that we give really great tours here at Palmetto Care, but as a horse owner myself, I can tell you the tours wouldn't matter if we couldn't take just as much pride in the care we give our animals, and we do. You know, the first question I ever had when I walked into that barn for the first time turns out to be the most common question I get, which is, do these animals live in this barn all year round? They don't even live in the barn all week round. The longest any of our animals can stay in the barn on a work shift is five days. And then we rotate them back out to our farm on John's Island for a period of rest and relaxation. Over the course of a year, we structure their schedule so that the time they work does not exceed their time off. I'm trying to get that same deal for myself right now. They get new shoes every four weeks. They get free dental care, free medical care. They're going to get a subsidized retirement. I'm trying to get that same deal for myself right now. Now, we're being drawn by a team of mules. Their names are Mary and Margaret. They're not Aww. Catholic that I know of. They are sisters. And you'll notice that some of the carriages are pulled by one animal and some of the carriages are pulled by two. That has to do with the overall weight of the animal in front. Umbo, by himself, weighs 2,400 pounds. These guys don't weigh that much alone, so it takes two of them to pull the carriage. And pulling the carriage is actually not difficult. These animals are capable of pulling three to five times their own body weight on a dry sled. The reason we need so much weight in front in an area like Charleston is not to pull the carriage, but to stop the carriage. Right, so when we stop, I don't have a break. I ask them to stop. They come to a halt, and then there's a breaching strap that wraps around their butts, and that just literally rolls back into it. And that's another one of our mules. Her name is Sissy. She's a very sweet girl. Now, this is Mary and Margaret. My name is Van. In addition to leading carriage tours, I also conduct cycling tours of Charleston, Hubert, and Savannah, and I'm a Charleston native. I grew up here. I've spent almost my entire life here. I have lived other places. I lived in Raleigh and Durham and Greensboro, North Carolina, and I also <coughs> lived in Washington, D.C. for a while, but I've spent the great majority of my life here in Charleston. It's actually my retirement job. Nice. Yeah. And you know what's so funny? And I kid you not, I wish I had known about this job before I started my career. Because this would have been my career. I've never been happier in my life. It's absolutely amazing. Now, I don't know if anybody has told you how the carriage industry in Charleston works, but I don't know where we're going. Right I don't get to make that decision. The city does. The city official in this game house. Hey, good morning. How are you doing? I've got 12 and 1 on carriage 284 with Mary and Margaret. So they, they charge a capitation tax. You know what a capitation no. tax is? one of my favorite words. The book tax. Oh. Can we say decapitate? Take your head off a capitation? That's a fancy word for a head tax. Now, she's got a bingo machine out front. It's got a variety of colored balls in it. When she runs it, one of those balls is going to pop up. And depending on what comes up, that's where we go on tour. So that's how that decision is made. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in forever. It's because of all the rain. It's been amazing. Man. Now, we were closed for six days. As you all know, there was major flooding, and we may get a little flooding event tonight. I'll explain that to you more during the tour. Thank you, Linda. I'll see you soon. Yeah, I've only worked one out of the last nine days. Yeah, it's amazing. We've got a forced vacation. <laughs> Now, I want y'all to feel welcome to ask questions while we're on tour. Charleston's got a long history, and I couldn't possibly do it justice in a single hour. 
Oh, if you have any questions about anything, just raise your hand or shout it out. Don't worry about disrupting my train of thought. I don't have one. You can just jump right in. And I like to think when you combine all my experiences that there's not a question y'all can ask me that I can't make up an answer to. So, have any of you done a carriage ride in Charleston before? Oh, awesome. No Googling. I, nothing I say is going to be contested. I'll give y'all three guesses why this is called Church Street. A church up ahead, St. Philip's Anglican Church, was built in 1838. The original burned down in a fire in 1835. It had been built in 1711. The previous church, just like this one, had an ornate English Baroque or Italian Renaissance style steeple. Those two terms can be used interchangeably. And it's churches like that with these ornate steeples that are visible when you approach Charleston from the sea that led early sailors to call this the Holy City. <laughs> so sailors coming in would use these as aids to navigation. They started calling Charleston the Holy City. It's not called the Holy City because of the behavior of the people. All right, that's very that's good, important. Though. To know. I know. In fact, when the first ship arrived in Charleston in 1670 with settlers from England, <coughs> it had on board 30 gallons of brandy and 15 tons of beer. Now, you don't have to be a genius to figure out if you're measuring your beer by the ton, you're planning on doing a little bit of drinking. And in 1681, the pastor of the congregation that worshiped at that church was reprimanded because he got drunk and baptized a bear cub. And it's a true story, man. It's not a poor guy story. He was actually, he was actually uh, goaded into doing it by some friends of his. Their friends, they, they didn't like it. And so they did it in order to shame him, and it worked. So, now, that's Charleston in 1681. What were they doing in 1692 in Salem, Massachusetts? Um, remember, they were trying witches. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a different sort of colony altogether. Yeah. Now, the little alleyway on the right is called Philadelphia Alley. Get a good look at it. It's named in honor of the people of Philadelphia who helped rebuild this section of town after a fire in 1810. That thing has also been called, so its official name is Philadelphia Alley. It's also been called Cow's Alley, Kinlock's Alley, Johnson's Alley, Dueler's Alley, and Whistler's Alley. If you're a native Charlestonian like me, you call it Whistler's Alley because of a whistling ghost that lives there. Charlestonians will sometimes call it Dueler's Alley as well because of the number of duels that were fought there. Now, dueling was illegal in Charleston. That never has stopped young men from engaging in a practice. The city paper actually used to write up descriptions <coughs> of the duel. One of my favorites comes from May of 1839. The paper said that two young men, it identified them as Mr. Fell and Mr. Harriet. It said they met there to settle their differences. And then this is what the paper said. It said Mr. Fell shot Mr. Harriet in the foot to keep him from running away. And then Mr. Harriet shot Mr. Fell in the mouth to make him shut up. <laughs> That's how you fight a duel. Now, Charleston, at the time it was founded, was the southernmost of the English colonies in North America. And St. Augustine, Florida, was the northernmost of the Spanish colonies. And those two empires were at war with one another. So Charleston would become the only walled city and the most fortified city in English North America. The original northern wall ran right behind where we are right now. We, so we are inside what would have been the original wall city. Now, because of the fire that struck here in 1796, none of these buildings were earlier than that, but they're built on the same footprint as the original wall city buildings. In fact, when you see etchings of this street done in the 1740s and 50s, it's hard to distinguish from what you're seeing today. Like you'd expect to see in a walled city, the buildings are built so that they share a wall. They're built townhouse style. One building runs right into the next. At that time, and today, many of these buildings served a double purpose. You would have had businesses on the bottom floor and residences on the upper floor. 
that's a residential entryway. So you enter the residences through alleys and archways, and then commercial entryways would face the street. These buildings look like they're made of stone, but they're not. These are not stone blocks. Those are actually brick buildings that have had been covered in a layer of stucco that has lines etched into it to make it look like stone. If you look at this building on the right, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You can see where the stucco is peeled away, revealing the brick underneath. And then take a look at this building across the street. That's what that brick looks like. It's called Country Brick or Charleston Gray Brick. Between 1740 and 1860, almost every building in the city was constructed of that brick. Are, are the bricks made here? They were. That's a great question. So the question was, are the bricks made here? They were between 1740 and 1860, almost every brick you see in the city was handmade by a slave working out on one of the nearby plantations. That's why it's so rough and irregular looking. It's not polished like Philadelphia red brick. So Early Charlestonians felt two ways about this brick. They either loved it or they hated it. The people that loved it, and I just read an article yesterday, <coughs> 1857, by William Gilmore Sims, one of Charleston's great writers, and he talks about how much he loved this brick, and he doesn't understand why others don't. He says, I can't understand why they cover this.